When was the last time you saw a video game writer holding a trophy in a picture? Have you ever thought, man, this storyline is transcendent, the best thing I've experienced since Harry Potter? If you say recently, may doves descend from heaven and heap praises on your precious golden head for the rest of your days. If you say, I don't know, or never, then we're going to change it. I'm Dave Connis, the newest member of the indomitable shoddy cast team, and I'm introducing a new series called The Stories Behind. I have dubbed this series such for two reasons. A, so that you, dear watcher, can meet and experience the men and women behind making the story, concepts, and character arcs in the games you play not suck really badly. B, because it's an incredibly witty title that I came up with all by myself. If you don't get it, there's an apostrophe between the Y and the S. Think on it. Percolate. So no more dilly-dallying shotters, shotting casters, shotcastians. We're going to start with one of my favorite games in the long and bespeckled history of all of humandom, Life is Strange. I personally can heap unending luminescent praise on Life is Strange. It's a different sort of video game that, as storytelling continues to grow in games, we'll see the likes of more often. Life is Strange is a story-driven game centered around a girl named Maxine Caulfield, who moves back to her childhood town of Arcadia Bay, Oregon, to attend a seniors-only boarding school named Blackwell Academy. Now, because this is the first episode of the stories behind, it might be beneficial to say that in a wide, generally speaking, sort of general, broad, generalized way, there are two forms of storytelling in games. The first being linear plot. You start at point A, and the game's narrative structure pushes you towards point B. Think Bioshock Infinite or Halo. The second sort of writing is what's referred to as the branching storyline. This sort of narrative structure starts every player at point A, but dependent on the choices that the player makes in the game, they can end at either point B, C, D, 1, 2, or 5. Life is Strange wasn't the first game to employ the narrative structure of branching storylines, so its uniqueness isn't solely based on that specific characteristic. No, the biggest reason Life is Strange stood out to me was because the story was so freaking good! It was released episodically, five episodes in all. The story is set in the Pacific Northwest during the fall, which, holy Moses, made me want to roll in a golden sun slash pine needle slash fall breeze bath until I died a crusty but hella relaxed old man. Life is Strange received good reviews commending the character development and tackling of don't touch that with an 80 foot pole subjects. Now that we know all that, here's the bread and butter stuff, the writers. Hallelujah for the writers. The writing team behind the story of Life is Strange consisted of Jean-Luc Cano and Christian Devine. I was able to wrangle both of them in an interview, which was miraculous on multiple levels, but mostly because Jean-Luc lives in Paris, Christian lives in LA, and I live in Georgia, so successfully navigating the logistics of three separate time zones made me feel like a time lord. Doctor Who aside, here's what I found out about Jean-Luc. Jean-Luc started working on video games through Don't Nod Studios, a French game developer located in Paris. He was lucky enough to snag a spot on the team writing their first title, Remember Me. He quickly rose to the ranks of the Remember Me Army and became the cinematic director for the game, and then went on to become the motion capture director. The game came out, thunderclap, lightning roared, everything was peaches and ponies except for some mixed reviews, but the studio probably had a rager of a release party in which rock bands melted faces with victory riffs and lights of various colors pulsed away to a never-ending song of celebration. PSA, I don't know if this happened, but let's just believe it for the sake of the children. At the end of Remember Me, Don't Nod asked Jean-Luc and a co-worker to imagine a new project using the rewind mechanic that Remember Me had used. With that in mind, Jean-Luc asked himself, What kind of game can we imagine to use the, the rewind? And from the beginning, I come with the idea of a story with a girl, with a, with a friendship of two girls. So when we stop with five episodes, and the story of Max and our best friend Chloe. I said, "Okay, guys, let me in my room, in my in my small, in my, in my small office, and I will come back in a few weeks with a with a draft." So he did. Jean Luc made himself a writer fortress, impenetrable from the evil everything that could be distracting, and just started to write, letting his main influence squeeze Stephen King infect his mind and creativity with amazingness. At the end of a coffee-fueled few weeks, he ended with a 100-page document that laid out the story of the game. 
Everything from the dialogue branches to the finale was on the document. And once the document was written, he passed his word baby to Don't Nod, and his contract for the project was closed. Done. Finished. Eternally ended. Kaputalicious. You probably remember that there was one other dude involved on this writing team that we haven't talked about, so let's put a bookmark in the story of the story of Life is Strange and meet Christian Devine. Christian is a writer slash screenwriter who writes movie scripts and video games. He just happened to grow up with some dude named John Romero. You may have heard of him. He's only the creator of Doom and Quake. And we were best friends, and so when we were in school, you know, John was, uh, would sit in front of me writing code in class for the games. He was selling already by age 15 or 16. And I'd be behind him drawing comics and writing stories, and I'd put John in all my films. But at a certain point when John blew up, you know, and uh, Doom and Quake came out, and he started Iron Storm, he read some of my scripts, and he asked me to come write for his game, Die Katana. His relationship with John Romero was another reason why he ended up moving out to Hollywood. And after 10 years there, he met a journalist writer while at a French press conference who knew a director at Don't Nod. So when whispers of Life is Strange started arriving on the breeze, Don't Nod contacted Christian. Now it's possible you're asking yourself something like, Don't Nod already had a story, why do they need another writer? Here's why. The name John Luke Kano? Yeah, that's French. The location of Don't Nod? Very French, Paris. You know what French people speak? French. The 100-page document Jean-Luc wrote, it was in French. Jean-Luc hadn't set the context of the game in France, he'd set it in America. And you know, I'm a, as a French guy, it's, I was raised with American TV show. You know, the, the X-Files, Buffy, the Vampire Slayer. Yep. And every, everything made, it's my culture, you know. For me, Life is Strange is the movie I will never direct. <laughs> because I'm French and I can't make a film like this in France. So what's a French game studio to do when they want to make a game whose story is based in America as authentic as possible? Dun dun dun! Hire an American writer to come in and add some bald eagles, some apple pie, and some soaring verses of the Star Spangled Banner. So now that we know that, we can come back to Christian. In order for Christian to be considered as a writer for the Life is Strange team, he had to take a writing test to convince Don't Nod that he was the most qualified American outside of Babe Ruth, John Philip Sousa, and Rosa Parks. You know, as you know, as you, know you have to take a test for video game companies often when you, uh, as a writer. And the tests aren't, aren't always representative of what you can do, but this was an amazing test. They sent me the scene with um, Chloe and David in the room fighting. And it was so amazing and so beautiful, and I could see immediately what they were going for. And so the test was really more just like describe what two characters would say in the room, this kind of thing. And so to me, that's exactly the kind of test I wanted to take because it's, it's focused specifically on the game. So Christian gets the job. Cue more celebration. And he sits down with Jean-Luc's document and gets to work. Jean-Luc nailed all the, I mean, all the archetypes and the relationships are all there. And so I would just go through and I'd go through all the character sheets and I would expand on things, create more backstory, give them more American backstory, pull out more personality traits or things that maybe the French team, you know, like they would perceive as a French thing, but I would say, well, in America, we don't do this. Because yeah. of you, we, we avoid a lot of cliché. You know, French are an American way of life or stuff like this. Huh. You, you, Christian, you put realism in our fantasy uh, of American way of life. He wasn't doing this by himself. Don't not help him along the way. They gave him script ideas for when he'd write out everything in screenplay format. They'd have ideas for how they want the mood for specific scenes. So they'd say, we want it to be really soft or playful, or we want it to have at least three bald eagles swooping across the backdrop of an American flag. The latter is something I'm assuming happened because America. Christian found himself developing a rich world that included a phrase that some people took to griping about. Hella. Wrong. You got hella cash. You are going to get in hella more trouble for this than drugs. You hella saved my life. It is hella cold out here. Hella? I hate that word, no offense. Now for uber clarification, this video host and writer didn't find much cringe-worthiness in the dialogue. As a writer myself, I respected times 103 that someone took the time to develop a specific and contextual vocabulary for a video game character. I'd just never seen that happen to the extent that Christian had done it, which led me to ask him about the gripe against the word Hella. Hella is a very common North California, uh, West Coast, and for every character, you have to give them a voice. Right. right. You have to give them some kind of distinctive speech pattern. And, right. And so, 
whether people like the word hell or not, people use it out there. It's okay to not like the word, but you can't say that nobody says it. Regardless of how you feel about Hella, the reception and success of Life is Strange speaks for itself. People connected with it. Something caught the emotions of players everywhere in a way that I hadn't seen since I picked up my first plastic gun and shot ducks that didn't have backstory. In the end, the story of Life is Strange didn't change much between when Jean-Luc first wrote it and when Christian expanded it with the context of the Pacific Northwest in mind. There were a few details and one or two scenes that changed, but the main story, the cliffhangers on the ends of episodes three and four, the diving into the photographs, the relationship between Chloe and Max, all of that was in the original draft. Dear watcher, because you're a fantastic and amazing person, you've met your first two paragraph architects, your first two writers. You learned how they got their skillful hands on Life is Strange, and now you can go buy the game and play it, and in those major moments where you realize there are massive globs of wet dripping down your face, and your controller is covered in orange because you're taking your emotions out on a family-sized bag of nacho cheesier Doritos, and when that final scene plays and the proverbial curtain draws back, leaving you alone alone with your inner demons, now you can shake your fist at the sky and yell CURSES on your dreadful talent to invoke all my feelings at once, Christian Divine. CURSES on your masterful French storytelling, Jean-Luc Cano. At least you have that at the end of this video. I'm Dave Connis, host of The Stories Behind. I'll see you next time.